Flow of life energy through the body, off which menstruation is a phase. Eichel expression. Let's dwell on this for a moment and see how it can become an opportunity for enlightenment. Often a woman is taken over by the pain body at that time. It has an extremely powerful energetic charge that can easily pull you into unconscious identification with it. You are then actively POS, obsessed by an energy field that occupies your inner space and pretends to be you, but, of course, is not you at all. It speaks through you, acts through you, thinks through you. It will create negative situations in your life so that it can feed on the energy. It wants more pain, in whatever form. I have described this process already. It can be vicious and destructive. It is pure pain, past pain, and it is not you. The number of women, who are now approaching the fully concise state already exceeds that of men, and will be growing even faster in the years to come. Men may catch up with them in the end. But for some considerable time, there will be a gap between the con. Sizeness of men and that of women. Women are regaining the function that is their birthright, and, therefore, comes to them more. Naturally than it does to men, to be a bridge between the manifested world and the unmanifested, between physicality and spirit. Your 139. The power of now. Main task as a woman now is to transmute the pain body so that it no longer comes between you and your true self, the essence of who you are. Of course, you also have to deal with the other obstacle to enlightenment, which is the thinking mind, but the intense presence you generate when dealing with the pain body will also free you from identification with the mind. The first thing to remember is this. As long as you make an identity for yourself out of the pain, you cannot become free of it. As long as part of your sense of self is invested in your emotional pain, you will unconsciously resist or sabotage every attempt that you make to heal that pain. Why? Quite simply because you want to keep yourself intact, and the pain has become an essential part of you. This is an unconscious process, and the only way to overcome it is to make it conscious. To suddenly see that you are, or have been attached to your pain, can be quite a shocking realization. The moment you realize this, you have broken the attachment. The pain body is an energy field, almost like an entity, that has become temporarily lodged in your inner space. It is life energy that has become trapped, energy that is no longer flowing. Of course, the pain body is there because of certain things that happened in the past. It is the living past in you, and if you identify with it, you identify with the past. A victim identity is the belief that the past is more powerful than the present, which is the opposite of the truth. It is the belief that other people, and what they did to you are responsible for who you are now, for your emotional pain, or your inability to be your true self. The truth is that the only power there is, is contained within this moment, it is the power of your presence. Once you know that, you also realize that you are responsible for your inner space now, nobody else is, and that the past cannot prevail against the power of the now. 140. Enlightened Relationships So identification prevents you from dealing with the pain body. Some women, who are already conscious enough to have relinquished their victim identity on the personal level, are still holding on to a collective victim identity, what men did to women. They are right, and they are also wrong. They are right in asmic, as the collective female pain body is in large part due to male violence inflicted on women and repression of the female principle throughout the planet over millennia. They are wrong if they derive a sense of self from this fact and thereby keep themselves imprisoned in a collective victim identity. If a woman is still holding on to anger, resentment, or condemnation, she is holding on to her pain body. This may give her a comforting sense of identity, of solidarity with other women, but it is keeping her in bondage to the past and blocking full access to her essence and true power. If women exclude themselves from men, that fosters a sense of separation and therefore a strengthening of the ego. And the stronger the ego, the more distant you are from your true nature. So do not use the pain body to give you an identity. Use it for enlightenment instead. Transmute it into consciousness. One of the best times for this is during menses. I believe that, in the years to come, many women will enter the fully conscious state during that time. Usually, it is a time of unconsciousness for many women, as they are taken over by the collective female pain body. Once you have reached a certain level of consciousness, however, you can reverse this, so instead of becoming unconscious you become more concise. I have described the basic process already, but let me take you through it again, this time with special reference to the collective female pain body. When you know that the menstrual flow is approaching, 
Before you feel the first signs of what is commonly called premenstrual tension, the awakening of the collective female pain body, become very alert and inhabit your body as fully as possible. When the first sign appears, you need to be alert enough to catch it before it takes you over. For example, the first sign may be a sudden strong irritation, or a flash of anger, or it may be a purely physical symptom. Whatever it. 141. The power of now is, catch it before it can take over your thinking or behavior. This imply means putting the spotlight of your attention on it. If it is an emo tie-in, feel the strong energy charge behind it. Know that it is the pain body. At the same time, be the knowing, that is to say, be aware of your conscious presence and feel its power. Any emotion that you take your presence into will quickly subside and become transmuted. If it is a purely physical symptom, the attention that you give it will prevent it from turning into an emotion or a thought. Then continue to be alert and wait for the next sign of the pain body. When it appears, catch it again in the same way as before. Later, when the pain body has fully awakened from its dormant state, you may experience considerable turbulence in your inner space for a while, perhaps for several days. Whatever form this takes, stay present. Give it your complete attention. Watch the turbulence. Inside you. Know it is there. Hold the knowing, and be the knowing. Remember, do not let the pain body use your mind and take over your thinking. Watch it. Feel its energy directly, inside your body. As you know, full attention means full acceptance. Through sustained attention and thus acceptance, there comes transmutation. The pain body becomes transformed into radiant consciousness, just as a piece of wood, when placed in or near a fire, itself is transformed into fire. Menstruation will then become not only a joyful and fulfilling expression of your womanhood, but also a sacred time of transmutation, when you give birth to a new consciousness. Your true nature then shines forth, both in its female aspect as the goddess, and in its transcendental aspect as the divine being that you are beyond male and female duality. If your male partner is conscious enough, he can help you with the practice I have just described by holding the frequency of intense presence particularly at this time. If he stays present whenever you fall back into unconscious identification with the pain body, which can and will happen at first, you will be able to quickly rejoin him in that state. This means that whenever the pain body temporarily takes over, whether during menses or at other times, your partner will not. 142. Enlightened relationships. Mistake it for who you are. Even if the pain body attacks him, as it probably will, he will not react to it as if it were you, withdraw, or put up some kind of defense. He will hold the space of intense presence. Nothing else is needed for transformation. At other times, you will be able to do the same for him, or help him reclaim consciousness from the mind by drawing his attention into the here, and now whenever he becomes identified with his thinking. In this way, a permanent energy field of a pure and high frequency will arise between you. No illusion, no pain, no conflict, nothing that is not you, and nothing that is not love can survive in it. This represents the fulfillment of the divine, transpersonal purpose of your relationship. It becomes a vortex of consciousness that will draw in many others. S. Give up the relationship with yourself. When one is fully conscious, would one still have a need for a relationship? Would a man still feel drawn to a woman? Would a woman still feel incomplete without a man? Enlightened or not, you are either a man or a woman, so on the level of your form identity you are not complete. You are one half of the whole. This incompleteness is felt as male-female attraction, the pull toward the opposite energy polarity, no matter how conscious you are. But in that state of inner connectedness, you feel this pull somewhere on the surface or periphery of your life. Anything that happens, to you in that state feels somewhat like that. The whole world seems like waves or ripples on the surface of a vast and deep ocean. You are that ocean and, of course, you are also a ripple, but a ripple that has realized its true identity as the ocean, and compared to that vastness and depth, the world of waves and ripples is not all that important. 143. The power of now. This does not mean that you don't relate deeply to other people, or to your partner. In fact, you can relate deeply only if you are conscious of being. Coming from being, you are able to focus beyond the veil of form. In being, male and female are one. 
Your form may continue to have certain needs, but being has none. It is already complete and whole. If those needs are met, that is beautiful, but whether or not they are met makes no difference to your deep inner state. So it is perfectly possible for an enlightened person, if the need for the male or female polarity is not met, to feel a sense of lack or incompleteness on the outer level of his or her being, yet at the same time be totally complete, fulfilled, and at peace within. In the quest for enlightenment, is being gay a help or a hindrance, or does it not make any difference? As you approach adulthood, uncertainty about your sexuality followed by the realization that you are different from others may force you to disidentify from socially conditioned patterns of thought and behavior. This will automatically raise your level of consciousness above that of the unconscious majority, whose members unquestioningly take on board all inherited patterns. In that respect, being gay can be a help. Being an outsider to some extent, someone who does not fit in with others or is rejected by them for whatever reason, makes life difficult, but it also places you at an advantage as far as enlightenment is concerned. It takes you out of unconsciousness almost by force. On the other hand, if you then develop a sense of identity based on your gayness, you have escaped one trap only to fall into another. You will play roles and games dictated by a mental image you have of yourself as gay. You will become unconscious. You will become unre. All underneath your ego mask, you will become very unhappy. If this happens to you, being gay will have become a hindrance. But you always get another chance, of course. Acute unhappiness can be a great awakener. 144. Enlightened relationships. Is it not true that you need to have a good relationship with yourself and love yourself before you can have a fulfilling relationship with another person? If you cannot be at ease with yourself when you are alone, you will seek a relationship to cover up your unease. You can be sure that the unease will then reappear in some other form within the relationship, and you will probably hold your partner responsible for it. All you really need to do is accept this moment fully. You are then at ease in the here and now and at ease with yourself. But do you need to have a relationship with yourself at all? Why can't you just be yourself? When you have a relationship with yourself, you have split yourself into two, I and myself, subject and object. That mind-created duality is the root cause of all unnecessary complexity, of all problems and conflict in your life. In the state of enlightenment, you are yourself, you and yourself merge into one. You do not judge yourself, you do not feel sorry for yourself, you are not proud of yourself, you do not love yourself, you do not hate yourself, and so on. The split caused by self-reflective consciousness is healed, its curse removed. There is no self that you need to protect, defend, or feed anymore. When you are enlightened, there is one relationship that you no longer have, the relationship with yourself. Once you have given that up, all your other relationships will be love relationships. 145 Chapter 9 Beyond Happiness and Unhappiness There is peace the higher good beyond good and bad. Is there a difference between happiness and inner peace? Yes. Happiness depends on conditions being perceived as positive, inner peace does not. Is it not possible to attract only positive conditions into our life? If our attitude and our thinking are always positive, we would manifest only positive events and situations, wouldn't we? Do you truly know what is positive and what is negative? Do you have the total picture? There have been many people for whom limitation, failure, loss, illness, or pain in whatever form turned out to be their greatest teacher. It taught them to let go of false self-images and superficial ego-dictated goals and desires. It gave them depth, humility, and compassion. It made them more real. Whenever anything negative happens to you, there is a deep less sun concealed within it, although you may not see it at the time. Even a brief illness or an accident can show you what is real and unreal in your life, what ultimately matters, and what doesn't. Seen from a higher perspective, conditions are always positive. To be more precise, they are neither positive nor negative. They are as they are. And when you live in complete acceptance of what is, which is the only sane way to live, there is no good or bad in. 147. The Power of Now your life in a more. There is only a higher good, which includes the bad. Seen from the perspective of the mind, however, there is good-bad, like-dislike, love-hate. 
Hence, in the book of Genesis, it is said that Adam and Eve were no longer allowed to dwell in paradise when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This sounds to me like denial and self-deception. When something dreadful happens to me or someone close to me, accident, illness, pain of some kind or death, I can pretend that it isn't had, but the fact remains that it is had, so why deny it? You are not pretending anything. You are allowing it to be as it is, that's all. This allowing to be takes you beyond the mind with its resistance patterns that create the positive-negative polarities. It is an essential aspect of forgiveness. Forgiveness of the present is even more important than forgiveness of the past. If you forgive every moment, allow it to be as it is, then there will be no accumulation of resentment that needs to be forgiven at some later time. Remember that we are not talking about happiness here. For example, when a loved one has just died, or you feel your own death approaching, you cannot be happy. It is impossible, possible. But you can be at peace. There may be sadness and tears, but provided that you have relinquished resistance, underneath the sadness you will feel a deep serenity, a stillness, a sacred presence. This is the emanation of being, this is inner peace, the good that has no opposite. What if it is a situation that I can do something about? How can I allow it to be and change it at the same time? Do what you have to do. In the meantime, accept what is. Since mind and resistance are synonymous, acceptance immediately frees you from mind dominance and thus reconnects you with being. As a result, the usual ego motivations for doing fear, greed, control. 148. Beyond happiness, and you n h a p p i n e s s t h e r e is peace. Defending or feeding the false sense of self will cease to operate. An intelligence much greater than the mind is now in charge, and so a different quality of consciousness will flow into your doing. Accept whatever comes to you woven in the pattern of your destiny, for what could more aptly fit your needs. This was written 2,000 years ago by Marcus Aurelius, one of those exceedingly rare humans who possessed worldly power as well as wisdom. It seems that most people need to experience a great deal of soft foeing before they will relinquish resistance and accept, before they will forgive. As soon as they do, one of the greatest miracles happens, the awakening of being consciousness through what appears as evil, the transmutation of suffering into inner peace. The ultimate effect of all the evil and suffering in the world is that it will force humans into realizing who they are beyond name and form. Thus, what we perceive as evil from our limited perspective is actually part of the higher good that has no opposite. This, however, does not become true for you except through forgiveness. Until that happens, evil has not been redeemed and therefore remains evil. Through forgiveness, which essentially means recognizing the insubstantiality of the past and allowing the present moment to be as it is, the miracle of transformation happens not only within, but also without. A silent space of intense presence arises both in you and around you. Whoever or whatever enters that field of consciousness will be affected by it, sometimes visibly and immediately, sometimes at deeper levels with visible changes appearing at a later time. You dissolve discord, heal pain, dispel unconsciousness, without doing anything, simply by being and holding that frequency of intense presence. 149. The power of now. The end of your life drama. In that state of acceptance and inner peace, even though you may not call it bad, can anything still come into your life that would be called had from a perspective of ordinary consciousness? Most of the so-called bad things that happen in people's lives are due to unconsciousness. They are self-created, or rather ego-created. I sometimes refer to those things as drama. When you are fully conscious, drama does not come into your life anymore. Let me remind you briefly how the ego operates and how it creates drama. Ego is the unobserved mind that runs your life when you are not present as the witnessing consciousness, the watcher. The ego perceives itself as a separate fragment in a hostile universe, with no real inner connection to any other being, surrounded by other egos which it either sees as a potential threat or which it will attempt to use for its own ends. The basic ego patterns are designed to combat its own deep-seated fear and sense of flack. They are resistance, control, power, greed, defense, attack. Some of the ego's strategies are extremely clever, yet they never truly solve any of its problems, simply because the ego itself is the problem. When egos come together, whether in personal relationships or in organizations or institutions, bad things happen sooner or later drama of one kind or another, in the form of conflict, problems, power struggles, 
emotional or physical violence, and so on. This includes collective evil such as war, genocide, and exploitation, all due to massed unconsciousness. Furthermore, many types of illness are caused by the ego's continuous resistance, which creates restrictions and blockages in the flow of energy through the body. When you reconnect with being and are no longer run by your mind, you cease to create those things. You do not create or participate in drama anymore. Whenever two or more egos come together, drama of one kind or another ensues. But even if you live totally alone, you still create your own drama. When you feel sorry for yourself, that's drama. When? 150. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. You feel guilty or anxious, that's drama. When you let the past or future obscure the present, you are creating time, psychological time, the stuff out of which drama is made. Whenever you are not hung or in the present moment by allowing it to be, you are creating drama. Most people are in love with their particular life drama. Their story is their identity. The ego runs their life. They have their whole sense of self invested in it. Even their, usually unsuccessful, search for an answer, a solution, or for healing becomes part of it. What they fear and resist most is the end of their drama. As long as they are their mind, what they fear and resist most is their own awakening. When you live in complete acceptance of what is, that is the end of all drama in your life. Nobody can even have an argument with you, no matter how hard he or she tries. You cannot have an argument with a fully conscious person. An argument implies identifica. Time with your mind in a mental position, as well as resistance and reaction to the other person's position. The result is that the polar opposites become mutually energized. These are the mechanics of unconsciousness. You can still make your point clearly and firmly, but there will be no reactive force behind it, no defense or attack. So it won't turn into drama. When you are fully conscious, you cease to be in conflict. No one who is at one with himself can even conceive of conflict, states a course in miracles. This refers not only to conflict with other people, but more fundamentally to conflict within you, which ceases when there is no longer any clash between the demands and expectations of your mind and what is. Impermanence and the cycles of life. However, as long as you are in the physical dimension and linked to the collective human psyche, physical pain, although rare, is still possible. This is not to be confused with suffering, with mental emotional pain. All suffering is ego-created and is due to resistance. Also, as long as you are in this dimension, you are still subject to its. 151. The power of now. Cyclical nature and to the law of impermanence of all things, but you no longer perceive this as bad it just is. Through allowing the isness of all things, a deeper dimension underneath the play of opposites reveals itself to you as an abiding presence, an unchanging deep stillness, an uncaused joy beyond good and bad. This is the joy of being, the peace of God. On the level of form, there is birth and death, creation and destruction, growth and dissolution, of seemingly separate forms. This is reflected everywhere, in the life cycle of a star or a planet, a physical body, a tree, a flower, in the rise and fall of nations, political systems, civilizations, and in the inevitable cycles of gain and loss in the life of an individual. There are cycles of success, when things come to you and thrive, and cycles of failure, when they wither or disintegrate, and you have to let them go in order to make room for new things to arise, or for trans. Formation to happen. If you cling and resist at that point, it means you are refusing to go with the flow of life, and you will suffer. It is not true that the up cycle is good and the down cycle bad, except in the mind's judgment. Growth is usually considered positive, but nothing can grow forever. If growth, of whatever kind, were to go on and on, it would eventually become monstrous and destructive. Dissolution is needed for new growth to happen. One cannot exist without the other. The down cycle is absolutely essential for spiritual realization. You must have failed deeply on some level, or experienced some deep loss or pain to be drawn to the spiritual dimension. Or perhaps your very success became empty and meaningless, and so turned out to be failure. Failure lies concealed in every success, and success in every failure. In this world, which is to say on the level of form, everybody fails sooner or later, of course, and every achievement eventually comes to naught. All forms are impermanent. You can still be active and enjoy manifesting and creating new forms and circumstances, but you won't be identified with them. You do not need them to give you a sense of self. They are not your life. 
Only your life situation. 152. Beyond happiness, and your n h a p p i n e s s t h e r e is peace. Your physical energy is also subject to cycles. It cannot always be at a peak. There will be times of low, as well as high energy. There will be periods when you are highly active and creative, but there may also be times when everything seems stagnant, when it seems that you are not getting anywhere, not achieving anything. A cycle can last for anything from a few hours to a few years. There are large cycles and small cycles within these large ones. Many illnesses are created through fighting against the cycles of low energy, which are vital for regeneration. The compulsion to do, and the tendency to derive your sense of self-worth and identity from external factors, such as achievement, is an inevitable illusion as long as you are identified with the mind. This makes it hard or impossible for you to accept the low cycles and allow them to be. Thus, the intelligence of the organism may take over as a self-protective measure and create an illness in order to force you to stop so that the necessary regeneration can take place. The cyclical nature of the universe is closely linked with the impermanence of all things and situations. The Buddha made this a central part of his teaching. All conditions are highly unstable and in constant flux, or, as he put it, impermanence is a characteristic of every condition, every situation you will ever encounter in your life. It will change, disappear, or no longer satisfy you. Impermanence is also central to Jesus's teaching, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal, as long as a condition is judged as good by your mind, whether it be a relationship, position, a social role, a place, or your physical body, the mind attaches itself to it and identifies with it. It makes you happy, makes you feel good about yourself, and it may become part of who you are or think you are. But nothing lasts in this diamond scion where moth and rust consume. Either it ends or it changes, or it may undergo a polarity shift. The same condition that was good yesterday or last year has suddenly or gradually turned into bad. The same condition that made you happy then makes you unhappy. The prosperity of today becomes the empty consumerism of tomorrow. The happy wedding and honeymoon become the unhappy divorce or 153. The power of now. The unhappy coexistence. Or a condition disappears, so its absence makes you unhappy. When a condition or situation that the mind has attached itself to and identified with changes or disappears, the mind cannot accept it. It will cling to the disappearing condition and resist the change. It is almost as if a limb were being torn off your body. We sometimes hear of people who have lost all their money or whose reputation has been ruined committing suicide. Those are the extreme cases. Others, whenever a major loss of one kind or another occurs, just become deeply unhappy or make themselves ill. They cannot distinguish between their life and their life situation. I recently read about a famous actress who died in her 80s. As her bow tie started to fade and became ravaged by old age, she grew desperately unhappy and became a recluse. She, too, had identified with a conditian, her external appearance. First, the condition gave her a happy sense of self, then an unhappy one. If she had been able to connect with the formless and timeless life within, she could have watched and allowed the fading of her external form from a place of serenity and peace. Moreover, her external form would have become increasingly transparent to the light shining through from her ageless true nature so her beauty would not really have faded, but simply become transformed into spiritual beauty. However, nobody told her that this is possible. The most essential kind of knowledge is not yet widely accessible. The Buddha taught that even your happiness is dukkha, a Pali word meaning suffering or unsatisfactoriness. It is inseparable from its opposite. This means that your happiness and unhappiness are in fact one. Only the illusion of time separates them. This is not being negative. It is simply recognizing the nature of things, so that you don't pursue an illusion for the rest of your life. 154. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. Nor is it saying that you should no longer appreciate pleasant or beautiful things or conditions. But to seek something through them that they cannot give, an identity, a sense of permanency and fulfillment, is a recipe for frustration and suffering. The whole advertising industry and consumer society would collapse if people became enlightened and no longer sought to find their identity through things. The more you seek happiness in this way, the more it will elude you. Nothing out there will ever satisfy you except temporarily and superficially, 
but you may need to experience many disillusionments before you realize the truth. Things and conditions can give you pleasure, but they will also give you pain. Things and conditions can give you pleasure, but they cannot give you joy. Nothing can give you joy. Joy is uncaused and arises from within as the joy of being. It is an essential part of the inner state of peace, the state that has been called the peace of God. It is your natural state, not something that you need to work hard for or struggle to attain. Many people never realize that there can be no salvation in anything they do, possess, or attain. Those who do realize it often become world-weary and depressed. If nothing can give you true fulfillment, what is there left to strive for? What is the point in anything? The Old Testament prophet must have arrived at such a realization when he wrote, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. When you reach this point, you are one step away from despair, and one step away from enlightenment. A Buddhist monk once told me, all I have learned in the twenty years that I have been a monk I can sum up in one sentence, all that arises passes away. This I know. What he meant, of course, was this. I have learned to offer no resistance to what is. I have learned to allow the present moment to be, and to accept the impermanent nature of all things and conditions. Thus have I found peace. To offer no resistance to life is to be in a state of grace, ease, and lightness. This state is then no longer dependent upon things being in a certain way, good or bad. It seems almost paradoxical yet when 155. The power of now. Your inner dependency on form is gone, the general conditions of your life, the outer forms, tend to improve greatly. Things, people, or conditions that you thought you needed for your happiness now come to you with no struggle or effort on your part, and you are free to enjoy and appreciate them while they last. All those things, of course, will still pass away, cycles will come and go, but with dependency gone there is no fear of loss anymore. Life flows with ease. The happiness that is derived from some secondary source is never very deep. It is only a pale reflection of the joy of being, the vibrant peace that you find within as you enter the state of non resistance Being takes you beyond the polar opposites of the mind and frees you from dependency on form. Even if everything were to collapse and crumble all around you, you would still feel a deep inner core of peace. You may not be happy, but you will be at peace. Using and relinquishing negativity. All, all inner resistance is experienced as negativity in one form or another. All negativity is resistance. In this context, the two words are almost synonymous. Negativity ranges from irritation or impatience to fierce anger, from a depressed mood or sullen resentment to sway sidle despair. Sometimes the resistance triggers the emotional pain body, in which case even a minor situation may produce intense energiativity, such as anger, depression, or deep grief. The ego believes that through negativity it can manipulate reality and get what it wants. It believes that through it, it can attract a deceer able condition or dissolve an undesirable one. A Course in Miracles rightly points out that, whenever you are unhappy, there is the unconscious belief that the unhappiness buys you what you want. If you, the mind, did not believe that unhappiness works, why would? 156. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. You create it. The fact is, of course, that negativity does not work. Instead of attracting a desirable condition, it stops it from arising. Instead of dissolving an undesirable one, it keeps it in place. Its only useful function is that it strengthens the ego, and that is why the ego loves it. Once you have identified with some form of negativity, you do not want to let go, and on a deeply unconscious level, you do not want positive change. It would threaten your identity as a depressed, angry, or hard done by person. You will then ignore, deny or sabotage the positive in your life. This is a common phenomenon. It is also insane. Negativity is totally unnatural. It is a psychic pollutant, and there is a deep link between the poisoning and destruction of nature, and the vast negativity that has accumulated in the collective human PSYJ. No other life form on the planet knows negativity, only humans. Just as no other life form violates and poisons the earth that sustains it. Have you ever seen an unhappy flower, or a stressed oak tree? Have you come across a depressed dolphin, a frog that has a problem with self-esteem, a cat that cannot relax, or a bird that carries hatred and resentment? 
The only animals that may occasionally experience something akin to negativity or show signs of neurotic behavior are those that live in close contact with humans and so link into the human mind and its insanity. Watch any plant or animal and let it teach you acceptance of what is surrender to the now. Let it teach you being. Let it teach you integrity, which means to be one, to be yourself, to be real. Let it teach you how to live and how to die, and how not to make living and dying into a problem. I have lived with several Zen masters, all of them cats. Even ducks have taught me important spiritual lessons. Just watching them is a meditation. How peacefully they float along, at ease with themselves, totally present in the now, dignified and perfect as only a mindless creature can be. Occasionally, however, two ducks will get into a fight, sometimes for no apparent reason, or because one. 157. The Power of Now Duck has strayed into another's private space. The fight usually lasts only for a few seconds, and then the ducks separate, swim off in opposite directions, and vigorously flap their wings a few times. They then continue to swim on peacefully, as if the fight had never happened. When I observed that for the first time, I suddenly realized that by flapping their wings they were releasing surplus energy, thus preventing it from becoming trapped in their body and turning into negativity. This is natural wisdom, and it is easy for them because they do not have a mind that keeps the past alive unnecessarily and then builds an identity around it. Couldn't a negative emotion also contain an important message? For example, if I often feel depressed, it may be a signal that there is something wrong with my life, and it may force me to look at my life situation and make some changes. So I need to listen to what the emotion is telling me and not just dismiss it as negative. Yes, recurring negative emotions do sometimes contain a message, as do illnesses. But any changes that you make, whether they have to do with your work, your relationships, or your surroundings, are ultimately only cosmetic unless they arise out of a change in your level of consciousness. And as far as that is concerned, it can only mean one thing, becoming more present. When you have reached a certain degree of presence, you don't need negativity anymore to tell you what is needed in your life situation. But as long as negativity is there, use it. Use it as a kind of signal that reminds you to be more present. How do we stop negativity from arising, and how do we get rid of it once it is there? As I said, you stop it from arising by being fully present. But don't become discouraged. There are as yet few people on the planet who can sustain a state of continuous presence, although some are getting close to it. Soon, I believe, there will be many more. 158. Beyond happiness, and you n h a p p i n e s s t h e r e is peace. Whenever you notice that some form of negativity has arisen within you, look on it not as a failure, but as a helpful signal that is telling you, wake up. Get out of your mind. Be present. There is a novel by Aldous Huxley called Island, written in his later years, when he became very interested in spiritual teachings. It tells the story of a man shipwrecked on a remote island cut off from the rest of the world. This island contains a unique civilization. The unusual thing about it is that its inhabitants, unlike those of the rest of the world, are actually sane. The first thing that the man notices are the colorful parrots perched in the trees, and they seem to be constantly croaking the words attention. Here and now. Attention. Here and now. We later learn that the islanders taught them these words in order to be reminded continuously to stay present. So whenever you feel negativity arising within you, whether caused by an external factor, a thought, or even nothing in particular that you are aware of, look on it as a voice saying attention. Here and now. Wake up. Even the slightest irritation is significant and needs to be acknowledged and looked at, otherwise, there will be a cumulative buildup of unobserved reactions. As I said before, you may be able to just drop it once you realize that you don't want to have this energy field inside you and that it serves no purpose. But then make sure that you drop it completely. If you cannot drop it, just accept that it is there and take your attention into the feeling, as I pointed out earlier. As an alternative to dropping a negative reaction, you can make it disappear by imagining yourself becoming transparent to the external cause of the reaction. I recommend that you practice it with little, even trivial, things first. Let's say that you are sitting quietly at home. Suddenly, there is the penetrating sound of a car alarm from across the street. Irritation arises. What is the purpose of the irritation? None whatsoever. Why did you create it? You didn't. The mind did. It was totally automatic, 
totally unconscious. Why did the mind create it? Because it holds the unconscious belief that its resistance, which you experience as negativity or unhappiness in some form, will. 159. The power of now somehow dissolve the undesirable condition. This, of course, is a delusion. The resistance that it creates, the irritation or anger in this case, is far more disturbing than the original cause that it is attempting to dissolve. All this can be transformed into spiritual practice. Feel yourself becoming transparent, as it were, without the solidity of a material body. Now allow the noise, or whatever causes a negative reaction, to pass right through you. It is no longer hitting a solid wall inside you. As I said, practice with little things first. The car alarm, the dog barking, the children screaming, the traffic jam. Instead of having a wall of resistance inside you that gets constantly and painfully hit by things that should not be happening, let everything pass through you. Somebody says something to you that is rude or designed to hurt. Instead of going into unconscious reaction and negativity, such as attack, defense, or withdrawal, you let it pass right through you. Offer no resistance. It is as if there is nobody there to get hurt anymore. That is forgiveness. In this way, you become invulnerable. You can still tell that person that his or her behavior is unacceptable, if that is what you choose to do. But that person no longer has the power to control your inner state. You are then in your power, not in someone else's, nor are you run by your mind. Whether it is a car alarm, a rude person, a flood, an earthquake, or the loss of all your posse science, the resistance mechanism is the same. I have been practicing meditation. I have been to workshops. I have read many books on spirituality. I try to be in a state of non-resistance. But if you ask me whether I have found true and lasting inner peace, my honest answer would have to be no, why haven't I found it? What else can I do? You are still seeking outside, and you cannot get out of the seeking mode. Maybe the next workshop will have the answer, maybe that new technique. To you I would say Dorft look for peace. Dorit look for any. 160. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. Other state than the one you are in now, otherwise, you will set up inner conflict and unconscious resistance. Forgive yourself for not being at peace. The moment you completely accept your non-peace, your non-peace becomes transmuted into peace. Anything you accept fully will get you there, will take you into peace. This is the miracle of surrender. You may have heard the phrase turn the other cheek, which a great teacher of enlightenment used 2000 years ago. He was attempting to convey symbolically the secret of non-resistance and non-reaction. In this statement, as in all his others, he was concerned only with your inner reality, not with the outer conduct of your life. Do you know the story of Banzan? Before he became a great Zen master, he spent many years in the pursuit of enlightenment, but it eluded him. Then one day, as he was walking in the marketplace, he overheard a conversation between a butcher and his customer. Give me the best piece of meat you have, said the customer. And the butcher replied, every piece of meat I have is the best. There is no piece of meat here that is not the best. Upon hearing this, Banzan became enlightened. I can see you are waiting for some explanation. When you accept what is, every piece of meat, every moment, is the best. That is enlightenment. The nature of compassion. Having gone beyond the mind-made opposites, you become like a deep lake. The outer situation of your life and whatever happens there, is the surface of the lake. Sometimes calm, sometimes windy and rough, according to the cycles and seasons. Deep down, how? Ever, the lake is always undisturbed. You are the whole lake, not just. 161. The power of now. The surface, and you are in touch with your own depth, which remains absolutely still. You don't resist change by mentally clinging to any situation. Your inner peace does not depend on it. You abide in being, unchanging, timeless, deathless, and you are no longer dependent for fulfillment or happiness on the outer world of constantly fluctuating forms. You can enjoy them, play with them, create new forms, appreciate the beauty of it all. But there will be no need to attach yourself to any of it. When you become this detached, does it not mean that you also become remote from other human beings? On the contrary, as long as you are unaware of being, the reality of other humans will elude you, because you have not found your own. Your mind will like or dislike their form, which is not just their body, but includes their mind as well. True relationship becomes possible only when there is an awareness of being. 
Coming from being, you will perceive another person's body and mind as just a screen, as it were, behind which you can feel their true reality, as you feel yours. So, when confronted with someone else's suffering or unconscious behavior, you stay present and in touch with being and are thus able to look beyond the form and feel the other person's radiant and pure being through your own. At the level of being, all suffering is recognized as an illusion. Suffering is due to identification with form. Miracles of healing sometimes occur through this realization, by awakening being consciousness in others, if they are ready. Is that what compassion is? Yes. Compassion is the awareness of a deep bond between yourself and all creatures. But there are two sides to compassion, two sides to this bond. On the one hand, since you are still here as a physical body, you share the vulnerability and mortality of your physical form with every other human and with every living being. Next time you say, I. 162. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. Have nothing in common with this person, remember that you have a great deal in common, a few years from now, two years or seven years, it doesn't make much difference, both of you will have become rotting corpses, then piles of dust, then nothing at all. This is a sobering and humbling realization that leaves little room for pride. Is this a negative thought? No, it is a fact. Why close your eyes to it? In that sense, there is total equality between you and every other creature. One of the most powerful spiritual practices is to meditate deeply on the mortality of physical forms, including your own. This is called, die before you die. Go into it deeply. Your physical form is dissolving, is no more. Then a moment comes when all mind forms or thoughts also die. Yet you are still there, the divine presence that you are. Radiant, fully awake. Nothing that was real ever died, only names, forms, and illusions. The realization of this deathless dimension, your true nature, is the other side of compassion. On a deep feeling level, you now recognize not only your own immortality, but through your own that of every other creature as well. On the level of form, you share mortality and the precariousness of existence. On the level of being, you share et now, radiant life. These are the two aspects of compassion. In compassion, the seemingly opposite feelings of sadness and joy merge into one and become transmuted into a deep inner peace. This is the peace of God. It is one of the most noble feelings that humans are capable of, and it has great healing and transformative power. But true compassion, as I have just described it, is as yet rare. To have deep empathy for the suffering of another being certainly requires a high degree of consciousness, but represents only one side of compassion. It is not complete. True compassion goes beyond empathy or 163. The power of now. Sympathy. It does not happen until sadness merges with joy, the joy of being beyond form, the joy of eternal life. Toward a different order of reality. J don't agree that the body needs to die. I am convinced that we can achieve physical immortality. We believe in death and that's why the body dies. The body does not die because you believe in death. The body exists, or seems to, because you believe in death. Body and death are part of the same illusion, created by the egoic mode of consciousness, which has no awareness of the source of life and sees itself as separate and constantly under threat. So it creates the illusion that you are a body, a dense, physical vehicle that is constantly under threat. To perceive yourself as a vulnerable body that was born and a lit TLE later dies, that's the illusion. Body and death, one illusion. You cannot have one without the other. You want to keep one side of the illusion and get rid of the other, but that is impossible. Either you keep all of it, or you relinquish all of it. However, you cannot escape from the body, nor do you have to. The body is an incredible misperception of your true nature. But your true nature is concealed somewhere within that illusion, not outside it, so the body is still the only point of access to it. If you saw an angel, but mistook it for a stone statue, all you would have to do is adjust your vision and look more closely at the stone statue, not start looking somewhere else. You would then find that there never was a stone statue. If belief in death creates the body, why does an animal have a body? An animal doesn't have an ego, and it doesn't believe in death. But it still dies, or seems to. Remember that your perception of the world is a reflection of 164. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. Your state of consciousness. You are not separate from it, and there is no objective world out there. Every moment, your consciousness creates the world that you inhabit. 
One of the greatest insights that has come out of modern physics is that of the unity between the observer and the observed. The person conducting the experiment, the observing consciousness, cannot be separated from the observed phenomena, and a different way of looking causes the observed PHE nomena to behave differently. If you believe, on a deep level, in separation and the struggle for survival, then you see that belief reflected all around you and your perceptions are governed by fear. You inhabit a world of death and of bodies fighting, killing, and devouring each other. Nothing is what it seems to be. The world that you create and see through the egoic mind may seem a very imperfect place, even a veil of tears. But whatever you perceive is only a kind of symbol, like an image in a dream. It is how your consciousness interprets and inter acts with the molecular energy dance of the universe. This energy is the raw material of so-called physical reality. You see it in terms of bodies and birth and death, or as a struggle for survival. An infinite number of completely different interpretations, completely different worlds, is possible, and, in fact, exists, all depending on the perceiving consciousness. Every being is a focal point of consciousness, and every such focal point creates its own world, although all those worlds are interconnected. There is a human world, an ant world, a dolphin world, and so on. There are countless beings whose consciousness frequency is so different from yours that you are probably unaware of their existence, as they are of yours. Highly conscious beings who are aware of their connectedness with the source and with each other would inhabit a world that to you would appear as a heavenly realm, and yet all worlds are ultimately one. Our collective human world is largely created through the level of consciousness we call mind. Even within the collective human world there are vast differences, many different subworlds, depending on the perceivers or creators of their respective worlds. Since all 165 the power of now worlds are interconnected. When collective human consciousness becomes transformed, nature and the animal kingdom will reflect that transformation. Hence the statement in the Bible that in the coming age, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. This points to the possibility of a completely different order of reality. The world as it appears to us now is, as I said, largely a reflection of the egoic mind. Fear being an unavoidable consequence of egoic delusion, it is a world dominated by fear. Just as the images in a dream are symbols of inner states and feelings, so our collective real iti is largely a symbolic expression of fear, and of the heavy layers of negativity that have accumulated in the collective human psyche. We are not separate from our world, so when the majority of humans become free of egoic delusion, this inner change will affect all of creation. You will literally inhabit a new world. It is a shift in planetary consciousness. The strange Buddhist saying that every tree and every blade of grass will eventually become enlightened points to the same truth. According to St. Paul, the whole of creation is waiting for humans to become enlightened. That is how I interpret his saying that the created universe is waiting with eager expectation for God's sons to be revealed. St. Paul goes on to say that all of creation will become redeemed through this. Up to the present, the whole created universe in all its parts groans as if in the pangs of childbirth. What is being born is a new consciousness, and, as its inevitable reflection, a new world. This is also foretold in the New Testament book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven, and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But don't confuse cause and effect. Your primary task is not to seek salvation through creating a better world, but to awaken out of identification with form. You are then no longer bound to this world, this level of reality. You can feel your roots in the unmanifested, and so are free of attachment to the manifested world. You can still enjoy the passing pleasures of this world, but there is no fear of loss anymore, so you don't need to cling to them. Although you can enjoy sensory pleasures, the craving for sensory experience is gone, as is the 166. Beyond happiness and unhappiness there is peace. Constant search for fulfillment through psychological gratification, through feeding the ego. You are in touch with something infinitely greater than any pleasure, greater than any manifested thing. In a way, you then don't need the world anymore. You don't even need it to be different from the way it is. It is only at this point that you begin to make a real contribution toward bringing about a better world, toward creating a different order of reality. It is only at this point that you are able to feel true compassion and to help others at the level of cause. Only those who have transcended the world can bring about a better world. You may remember that we talked about the dual nature of true compassion, which is awareness of a common bond of shared mortality and immortality. At this deep level, compassion becomes healing in the widest sense. In that state, 
Your healing influence is primarily based not on doing, but on being. Everybody you come in con. Tacked with will be touched by your presence and affected by the peace. That you emanate, whether they are conscious of it or not. When you are fully present and people around you manifest unconscious behave I or, you won't feel the need to react to it, so you don't give it any real itty. Your peace is so vast and deep that anything that is not peace disappears into it as if it had never existed. This breaks the karmic cycle of action and reaction. Animals, trees, flowers will feel your peace and respond to it. You teach through being, through demonstrating the peace of God. You become the light of the world, an emanation of pure consciousness, and so you eliminate suffering on the level of cause. You eliminate unconsciousness from the world. This doesn't mean that you may not also teach through doing, for example, by pointing out how to disidentify from the mind, recognize unconscious patterns within oneself, and so on. But who you and I fell? 167. The power of now. Always a more vital teaching and a more powerful transformer of the world than what you say, and more essential even than what you do. Furthermore, to recognize the primacy of being, and thus work on the level of cause, does not exclude the possibility that your compass scion may simultaneously manifest on the level of doing and of effect, by alleviating suffering whenever you come across it. When a hungry person asks you for bread and you have some, you will give it. But as you give the bread, even though your interaction may only be very brief, what really matters is this moment of shared being, of which the bread is only a symbol. A deep healing takes place within it. In that moment, there is no giver, no receiver. But there shouldn't be any hunger and starvation in the first place. How can we create a better world without tackling evils such as hunger and violence first? All evils are the effect of unconsciousness. You can alleviate the effects of unconsciousness, but you cannot eliminate them unless you eliminate their cause. True change happens within, not without. If you feel called upon to alleviate suffering in the world, that is a very noble thing to do, but remember not to focus exclusively on the outer, otherwise, you will encounter frustration and despair. Without a profound change in human consciousness, the world's suffering is a bottomless pit. So don't let your compassion become one-sided. Empathy with someone else's pain or lack in a desire to help need to be balanced with a deeper realization of the eternal nature of all life and the ultimate illusion of all pain. Then let your peace flow into whatever you do, and you will be working on the lev L's of effect and cause simultaneously. This also applies if you are supporting a movement designed to stop deeply unconscious humans from destroying themselves, each other, and the planet, or from continuing to inflict dreadful suffering on other sentient beings. Remember just as you cannot fight the darkness, so you cannot fight unconsciousness. If you try to do so. 168. Beyond happiness and unhap oneness there is peace. The polar opposites will become strengthened and more deeply entrenched. You will become identified with one of the polarities, you will create an enemy, and so be drawn into unconsciousness yourself raise awareness by disseminating information, or at the most, practice passive resistance. But make sure that you carry no racist taunts within, no hatred, no negativity. Love your enemies, said Jesus, which, of course, means have no enemies. Once you get involved in working on the level of effect, it is all too easy to lose yourself in it. Stay alert and very, very present. The causal level needs to remain your primary focus, the teaching of enlightenment your main purpose, and peace your most precious gift to the world. 169. Chapter 10. The meaning of surrender. Acceptance of the now. You mentioned surrender a few times. I don't like that idea. It sounds somewhat fatalistic. If we always accept the way things are, we are not going to make any effort to improve them. It seems to me what progress is all about, both in our personal lives and collectively, is not to accept the limitations of the present hut to strive to go beyond them and create something better. If we hadn't done this, we would still be living in caves. How do you reconcile surrender with changing things and getting things done? To some people, surrender may have negative connotations, implying defeat, giving up, failing to rise to the challenges of life, becoming lethargic, and so on. True surrender, however, is something entirely different. It does not mean to passively put up with whatever situation time you find yourself in and to do nothing about it. Nor does it mean to cease making plans or initiating positive action. Surrender is the simple but profound wisdom of yielding to rather than opposing the flow of life. The only place where you can experience the flow of life is the now, 
such a surrender is to accept the present moment unconditionally and without reservation. It is to relinquish inner resistance to what is. Inner resistance is to say no to what is, through mental judgment and emotional negativity. It becomes particularly pronounced when things go wrong, which means that there is a gap between the demands or rigid expectations of your mind and what is. That is the pain gap. If you have lived long. 171. The power of now. Enough, you will know that things go wrong quite often. It is precisely at those times that surrender needs to be practiced if you want to eliminate pain and sorrow from your life. Acceptance of what is immediately frees you from mind identification and thus reconnects you with being. Resistance is the mind. Surrender is a purely inner phenomenon. It does not mean that on the outer level you cannot take action and change the situation. In fact, it is not the overall situation that you need to accept when you surrender, but just the tiny segment called the now. For example, if you were stuck in the mud somewhere, you wouldn't say, okay, I resign myself to being stuck in the mud. Resignation is not surrender. You don't need to accept an undesirable or unpleasant life situation. Nor do you need to deceive yourself and say that there is nothing wrong with being stuck in the mud. No. You recognize fully that you want to get out of it. You then narrow your attention down to the present moment without mentally labeling it in any way. This means that there is no judgment of the now. Therefore, there is no resistance, no emotional negativity. You accept the isness of this moment. Then you take action and do all that you can to get out of the mud. Such action I call positive action. It is far more effective than negative action, which arises out of anger, despair, or frustration. Until you achieve the desired result, you continue to practice surrender by refraining from labeling the now. Let me give you a visual analogy to illustrate the point I am making. You are walking along a path at night, surrounded by a thick fog. But you have a powerful flashlight that cuts through the fog and creates a narrow, clear space in front of you. The fog is your life situation, which includes past and future. The flashlight is your conscious presence, the clear space is the now. Non-surrender hardens your psychological form, the shell of the ego, and so creates a strong sense of separateness. The world around you and people in particular come to be perceived as threatening. The unconscious compulsion to destroy others through judgment arises, as does the need to compete and dominate. Even nature becomes your 172. The meaning of surrender. Enemy and your perceptions and interpretations are governed by fear. The mental disease that we call paranoia is only a slightly more acute form of this normal but dysfunctional state of consciousness. Not only your psychological form, but also your physical form, your body, becomes hard and rigid through resistance. Tension arises in different parts of the body, and the body as a whole contracts. The free flow of life energy through the body, which is essentile for its healthy functioning, is greatly restricted. Body work and certain forms of physical therapy can be helpful in restoring this flow, but unless you practice surrender in your everyday life, those things can only give temporary symptom relief since the cause, the rhesus dance pattern, has not been dissolved. There is something within you that remains unaffected by the transient circumstances that make up your life situation, and only through surrender do you have access to it. It is your life, your very being, which exists eternally in the timeless realm of the present. Finding this life is the one thing that is needed that Jesus talked about. If you find your life situation unsatisfactory, or even intolerable, it is only by surrendering first that you can break the unconscious rhesus dance pattern that perpetuates that situation. Surrender is perfectly compatible with taking action, initiating change, or achieving goals. But in the surrendered state a totally different energy, a different quality, flows into your doing. Surrender reconnects you with the source energy of being, and if your doing is infused with being, it becomes a joyful celebration of life energy that takes you more deeply into the now. Through non-resistance, the quality of your consciousness and, therefore, the quality of hate for you are doing or creating is enhanced immeasurably. The results will 173. The power of now. Then look after themselves and reflect that quality. We could call this surrendered action. It is not work, as we have known it for our sands of years. As more humans awaken, the word work is going to disappear from our vocabulary, and perhaps a new word will be created to replace it. It is the quality of your consciousness at this moment that is the main determinant of what kind of future you will experience. So to surrender, 
is the most important thing you can do to bring about POS of change. Any action you take is secondary. No truly positive action can arise out of an unsurrendered state of consciousness. I can see that if I am in a situation that is unpleasant or unsatisfactory, and I completely accept the moment as it is, there will be no self-flowing or unhappiness. I will have risen above it. But I still can't quite see where the energy or motivation for taking action and bringing about change would come from if there isn't a certain amount of dissatisfaction. In the state of surrender, you see very clearly what needs to be done, and you take action, doing one thing at a time and focusing on one thing at a time. Learn from nature, see how everything gets accomplished and how the miracle of life unfolds without dissatisfaction or unhappiness. That's why Jesus said, look at the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. If your overall situation is unsatisfactory or unpleasant, separate out this instant and surrender to what is. That's the flashlight cutting through the fog. Your state of consciousness then ceases to be controlled by external conditions. You are no longer coming from reactive and resistance. Then look at the specifics of the situation. Ask yourself, is there anything I can do to change the situation, improve it, or remove myself from it? If so, you take appropriate action. Focus not on the IOO things that you will or may have to do at some future time, but on the one thing that you can do now. This doesn't mean you should not. 174. The meaning of surrender. Do any planning. It may well be that planning is the one thing you can do now. But make sure you don't start to run mental movies, project yourself into the future, and so lose the now. Any action you take may not bear fruit immediately. If your overall situa situation is unsatisfactory or unpleasant, separate out this instant and surrender to what is. That's the flashlight cutting through the fog. Your state of consciousness then ceases to be controlled by external conditions. You are no longer coming from reactive and resistance. Then look at the specifics of the situation. Ask yourself, is there anything I can do to change the situation, improve it, or remove myself from it? If so, you take appropriate action. Focus not on the IOO things that you will or may have to do at some future time, but on the one thing that you can do now. This doesn't mean you should not. 174. The meaning of surrender. Do any planning. It may well be that planning is the one thing you can do now. But make sure you don't start to run mental movies, project yourself into the future, and so lose the now. Any action you take may not bear fruit immediately. Until it does, do not resist what is. If there is no action you can take, and you cannot remove yourself from the situation either, then use the situation to make you go more deeply into surrender, more deeply into the now, more deeply into being. When you enter this timeless dimension of the present, change often comes about in strange ways without the need for a great deal of doing on your part. Life becomes helpful and cooperative. If inner factors such as fear, guilt, or inertia prevented you from taking action, they will dissolve in the light of your conscious presence. Do not confuse surrender with an attitude of I can't be bothered anymore, or I just don't care anymore. If you look at it closely, you will find that such an attitude is tainted with negativity in the form of hidden resentment and so is not surrender at all but masked resistance. As you surrender, direct your attention inward to check if there is any trace of resistance left inside you. Be very alert when you do so, otherwise, a pocket of resistance may continue to hide in some dark corner in the form of a thought or an unacknowledged emotion. From mind energy to spiritual energy. Letting go of resistance is easier said than done. I still don't see clearly how to let go. If you say it is by surrendering, the question remains, how? Start by acknowledging that there is resistance. Be there when it hap. Pens, when the resistance arises. Observe how your mind creates it, how it labels the situation, yourself, or others. Look at the thought. Process involved. Feel the energy of the emotion. By witnessing the resistance, you will see that it serves no purpose. By focusing all your attention on the now, the unconscious resistance is made conscious, and that is the end of it. You cannot be conscious and unhappy, con. 175. The power of now. Science and in negativity. Negativity, unhappiness, or suffering in whatever form means that there is resistance, and resistance is always unconscious. Surely I can be conscious of my unhappy feelings. 
Would you choose unhappiness? If you did not choose it, how did it arise? What is its purpose? Who is keeping it alive? You say that you are conscious of your unhappy feelings, but the truth is that you are identified with them and keep the process alive through compulsive thinking. All that is unconscious. If you were conscious, that is to say totally present in the now, all negativity would dissolve almost instantly. It could not survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence. Even the pain body cannot survive for long in your presence. You keep your unhappiness alive by giving it time. That is its lifeblood. Remove time through intense present moment awareness and it dies. But do you want it to die? Have you truly had enough? Who would you be without it? Until you practice surrender, the spiritual dimension is something you read about, talk about, get excited about, write books about, think about, believe in, or dwarfed, as the case may be. It makes no difference. Not until you surrender does it become a living reality in your life. When you do, the energy that you emanate, and which then runs your life, is of a much higher vibrational frequency than the mind energy that still runs our world, the energy that created the existing social, political, and economic structures of our civilization, and which also continuously perpetuates itself through our educational systems and the media. Through surrender, spiritual energy comes into this world. It creates no suffering for yourself, for other humans, or any other life form on the planet. Unlike mind energy, it does not pollute the earth, and it is not subject to the law of polarity ties, which dictates that nothing can exist without its opposite, that there can be no good without bad. Those who run on mind energy, which is still the vast majority of the Earth's population, remain. 176. The meaning of surrender. Unaware of the existence of spiritual energy. It belongs to a different order of reality, and will create a different world when a sufficient number of humans enter the surrendered state, and so become totally free of negativity. If the earth is to survive, this will be the energy of those who inhabit it. Jesus referred to this energy when he made his famous prophetic statement in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the gentle, they shall have the earth for their possession. It is a silent but intense presence that dissolves the unconscious patterns of the mind. They may still remain active for a while, but they won't run your life anymore. The external conditions that were being resisted also tend to shift or dissolve quickly through surrender. It is a powerful transformer of situations and people. If conditions do not shift immediately, your acceptance of the now enables you to rise above them. Either way, you are free. Surrender in personal relationships. What about people who want to use me, manipulate, or control me? Am I to surrender to them? They are cut off from being, so they unconsciously attempt to get energy and power from you. It is true that only an unconscious person will try to use or manipulate others, but it is equally true that only an unconscious person can be used and manipulated. If you resist or fight unconscious behavior in others, you become unconscious yourself. But surrender doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be used by unconscious people. Not at all. It is perfectly possible to say no firm lie and clearly to a person, or to walk away from a situation and be in a state of complete inner non-resistance at the same time. When you say no to a person or a situation, let it come not from reaction but from Insight, from a clear realization of what is right or not right for you at that moment. Let it be a non-reactive no, a high-quality no, a no. That is free of all negativity and so creates no further suffering. 177. The power of now. I am in a situation at work that is unpleasant. I have tried to surrender to it, but I find it impossible. A lot of resistance keeps coming up. If you cannot surrender, take action immediately, speak up or do something to bring about a change in the situation, or remove yourself from it. Take responsibility for your life. Do not pollute your beautiful, radiant inner being nor the earth with negativity. Do not give unhappiness in any form whatsoever a dwelling place inside you. If you cannot take action, for example if you are in prison, then you have two choices left, resistance or surrender. Bondage or inner freedom from external conditions. Suffering or inner peace. Seven's non-resistance also to be practiced in the external conduct of our lives, such as non-resistance to violence, or is it something that just concerns our inner life? You only need to be concerned with the inner aspect. That is prima r y. Of course, that will also transform the conduct of your outer life, your relationships, and so on. Your relationships will be changed profoundly by surrender. If you can never accept what is, by implication you will not be able to accept anybody the way they are. 
You will judge, criticize, label, reject, or attempt to change people. Furthermore, if you continuously make the now into a means to an end in the future, you will also make every person you encounter or relate with into a means to an end. The relationship, the human being, is then of secondary importance to you, or of no importance at all. What you can get out of the relationship is primary, be it material gain, a sense of power, physical pleasure, or some form of ego gratification. Let me illustrate how surrender can work in relationships. When you become involved in an argument, or some conflict situation, perhaps with a partner, or someone close to you, start by observing how defensive you become as your own position is attacked, or feel the force of your own aggression as you attack the other person's. 178. The meaning of surrender. Position. Observe the attachment to your views and opinions. Feel the mental emotional energy behind your need to be right and make the other person wrong. That's the energy of the egoic mind. You make it conscious by acknowledging it, by feeling it as fully as POS Cybel. Then one day, in the middle of an argument, you will suddenly realize that you have a choice, and you may decide to drop your own reaction, just to see what happens. You surrender. I don't mean dropping the reaction just verbally by saying okay, you are right, with a look on your face that says, I am above all this childish unconsciousness. That's just displacing the resistance to an off a level, with the egoic mind still in charge, claiming superiority. I am speaking of letting go of the entire mental emotional energy field inside you that was fighting for power. The ego is cunning, so you have to be very alert, very present, and totally honest with yourself to see whether you have truly relinquished your identification with a mental position and so freed yourself from your mind. If you suddenly feel very light, clear and deeply at peace, that is an unmistakable sign that you have truly surrendered. Then observe what happens to the other person's mental position as you no longer energize it through resistance. When identification with mental positions is out of the way, true communication begins. What about non-resistance in the face of violence, aggression, and the like? Non-resistance doesn't necessarily mean doing nothing. All it means is that any doing becomes non-reactive. Remember the deep wisdom underlying the practice of Eastern martial arts. Don't resist the opponent, s force. Yield to overcome. Having said that, doing nothing, when you are in a state of intense presence, is a very powerful transformer and healer of situations and people. In Taoism, there is a term called Wu Wei, which is usually translated as actionless activity, or sitting quietly d nothing. In ancient China, this was regarded as one of the highest. 179. The power of now. Achievements or virtues. It is radically different from inactivity in the ordinary state of consciousness, or rather unconsciousness, which stems from fear, inertia, or indecision. The real doing nothing implies inner non-resistance and intense alertness. On the other hand, if action is required, you will no longer react from your conditioned mind, but you will respond to the situation out of your conscious presence. In that state, your mind is free of concepts, including the concept of non-violence. So who can predict what you will do? The ego believes that in your resistance lies your strength, whereas in truth resistance cuts you off from being the only place of true power. Resistance is weakness and fear masquerading as strength. What the ego sees as weakness is your being in its purity, innocence, and power. What it sees as strength is weakness. So the ego exists in a continuous resistance mode and plays counterfeit roles to cover up your weakness, which in truth is your power. Until there is surrender, unconscious role-playing constitutes a large part of human interaction. In surrender, you no longer need ego defenses and false masks. You become very simple, very real. That's dangerous, says the ego. You'll get hurt. You'll become vulnerable. What the ego doesn't know, of course, is that only through the letting go of resistance, through becoming vulnerable, can you discover your true and essential invulnerability. Transforming illness into enlightenment. If someone is seriously ill and completely accepts their condition and surrenders to the illness, would they not have given up their will to get back to health? The determination to fight the illness would not be there anymore, would it? Surrender is inner acceptance of what is without any reservations. We are talking about your life, this instant, not the conditions or circumstances of your life, not what I call your life situation. We have 180. The meaning of surrender. Spoken about this already. With regard to illness, this is what it means. 
Illness is part of your life situation. As such, it has a past and a future. Past and future form an uninterrupted continuum, unless the redeeming power of the now is activated through your conscious presence. As you know, underneath the various conditions that make up your life situation, which exists in time, there is something deeper, more essential, your life, your very being in the timeless now. As there are no problems in the now, there is no illness either. The belief in a label that someone attaches to your condition keeps the condition in place, empowers it, and makes a seemingly solid reality out of a temporary imbalance. It gives it not only reality and solidity, but also a continuity in time that it did not have before. By focusing on this instant and refraining from labeling it mentally, illness is reduced to one or several of these factors, physical pain, weak. Ness, discomfort, or disability. That is what you surrender to. Now, you do not surrender to the idea of illness. Allow the suffering to force you into the present moment, into a state of intense conscious presence. Use it for enlightenment. Surrender does not transform what is, at least not directly surrender transforms you. When you are transformed, your whole world is transformed, because the world is only a reflection. We spoke about this earlier. If you looked in the mirror and did not like what you saw, you would have to be mad to attack the image in the mirror. That is precisely what you do when you are in a state of non-acceptance. And of course, if you attack the image, it attacks you back. If you accept the image, no matter what it is, if you become friendly toward it, it cannot not become friendly toward you. This is how you change the world. Illness is not the problem. You are the problem, as long as the egoic mind is in control. When you are ill or disabled, do not feel that. You have failed in some way, do not feel guilty. Do not blame life for treating you unfairly, but do not blame yourself either. All that is resistance. If you have a major illness, use it for enlightenment. 181. The power of now. Anything bad that happens in your life, use it for enlightenment. Withdraw time from the illness. Do not give it any past or future. Let it force you into intense present moment awareness and see what happens. Become an alchemist. Transmute base metal into gold, suffering into consciousness, disaster into enlightenment. Are you seriously ill and feeling angry now about what I have just said? Then that is a clear sign that the illness has become part of your sense of self, and that you are now protecting your identity, as well as protecting the illness. The condition that is labeled illness has nothing to do with who you truly are. When disaster strikes. As far as the still unconscious majority of the population is concerned, only a critical limit situation has the potential to crack the hard shell of the ego and force them into surrender, and so into the awakened state. A limit situation arises when through some disaster, drastic upheaval, deep loss, or suffering your whole world is shattered and doesn't make sense anymore. It is an encounter with death, be it physical or psychological. The egoic mind, the creator of this world, collapses. Out of the ashes of the old world, a new world can then come into being. There is no guarantee, of course, that even a limit situation will do it, but the potential is always there. Some people's resistance to what is even intensifies in such a situation, and so it becomes a descent into hell. In others, there may only be partial surrender, but even that will give them a certain depth and serenity that were not there before. Parts of the ego shall break off, and this allows small amounts of the radiance and peace that lie beyond the mind to shine. Through Limit situations have produced many miracles. There have been murderers in death row waiting for execution who, in the last few hours of their lives, experienced the ego estate and the deep joy and peace that come with it. The inner resistance to the situation they. 182. The meaning of surrender. Found themselves in became so intense as to produce unbearable suffering, and there was nowhere to run and nothing to do to escape it, not even a mind-projected future. So they were forced into complete acceptance of the unacceptable. They were forced into surrender. In this way, they were able to enter the state of grace with which comes redemption, complete release from the past. Of course, it is not real by the limit situation that makes room for the miracle of grace and redemption, but the act of surrender. So whenever any kind of disaster strikes, or something goes seri or usually wrong illness, disability, loss of home or fortune, or of a socially defined identity, breakup of a close relationship, death or suffering of a loved one, or your own impending death, know that there is another side to it, that you are just one step away from something incredible. A complete alchemical transmutation of the base metal of
pain and suffering into gold. That one step is called surrender. I do not mean to say that you will become happy in such a situation. You will not. But fear and pain will become transmuted into an inner peace and serenity that come from a very deep place, from the unmanifested itself. It is the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Compared to that, happiness is quite a shallow thing. With this radiant peace comes the realization, not on the level of mind, but within the depth of your being, that you are indestructible, immortal. This is not a belief. It is absolute certainty that needs no external evidence or proof from some secondary source. Transforming suffering into peace. I read about a Stoic philosopher in ancient Greece who, when he was told that his son had died in an accident, replied, Jay knew he was not immortal, is that surrender? If it is, I don't want it. There are some situations in which surrender seems unnatural and inhuman. Being cut off from your feelings is not surrender. But we don't know. What his inner state was when he said those words. In certain extreme situations, it may still be impossible for you to assemble the 183. The power of now. Now. But, but you always get a second chance at surrender. Your first chance is to surrender each moment to the reality of that moment. Knowing that what is cannot be undone, because it already is, you say yes to what is or accept what isn't. Then you do what you have to do, whatever the situation requires. If you abide in this state of acceptance, you create no more negativity, no more suffering, no more unhappiness. You then live in a state of non-resistance, a state of grace and lightness, free of struggle. Whenever you are unable to do that, whenever you miss that chance, either because you are not generating enough conscious presence to prevent some habitual and unconscious resistance pattern from arising, or because the condition is so extreme as to be absolutely unacceptable to you, then you are creating some form of pain, some form of suffering. It may look as if the situation is creating the suffering, but ultimately this is not so, your resistance is. Now here is your second chance at surrender if you cannot. Accept what is outside, then accept what is inside. If you cannot accept the external condition, accept the internal condition. This means, do not resist the pain. Allow it to be there. Surrender to the grief, despair, fear, loneliness, or whatever form the suffering takes. Witness it without labeling it mentally. Embrace it. Then see how the miracle of surrender transmutes deep suffering into deep peace. This is your crucifixion. Let it become your resurrection and ascension. I do not see how one can surrender to suffering. As you yourself point it out, suffering is non-surrender. How could you surrender to non-surrender? Forget about surrender for a moment. When your pain is deep, all talk of surrender will probably seem futile and meaningless anyway. When your pain is deep, you will likely have a strong urge to escape from it rather than surrender to it. You don't want to feel what you feel. What could be more normal? But there is no escape, no way out. There are many pseudo-escapes, work, drink, drugs, anger. 184. The meaning of surrender. Projection, suppression, and so on, but they don't free you from the pain. Suffering does not diminish in intensity when you make it unconscious. When you deny emotional pain, everything you do or think as well as your relationships become contaminated with it. You broadcast it, so to speak, as the energy you emanate, and others will pick it up subliminally. If they are unconscious, they may even feel compelled to attack or hurt you in some way, or you may hurt them in an unconscious projection of your pain. You attract and manifest whatever corresponds to your inner state. When there is no way out, there is still always a way through. So don't turn away from the pain. Face it. Feel it fully. Feel it, don't think about it. Express it if necessary, but don't create a script in your mind around it. Give all your attention to the feeling, not to the person, event, or situation that seems to have caused it. Don't let the mind use the pain to create a victim identity for yourself out of it. Feeling sorry for yourself and telling others your story will keep you stuck in suffering. Since it is impossible to get away from the feeling, the only possibility of change is to move into it, otherwise, nothing will shift. So give your complete attention to what you feel, and refrain from mentally labeling it. As you go into the feeling, be intensely alert. At first, it may seem like a dark and terrifying place, and when the urge to turn away from it comes, observe it but don't act on it. Keep putting your attention on the pain, keep feeling the grief, the fear, the dread, the loneliness, whatever it is. 
Stay alert, stay present, present with your whole being, with every cell of your body. As you do so, you are bringing a light into this darkness. This is the flame of your consciousness. At this stage, you don't need to be concerned with surrender anymore. It has happened already. How? Full attention is full acceptance. Is surrender. By giving full attention, you use the power of the now, which is the power of your presence. No hidden pocket of resistance can survive in it. Presence removes time. Without time, no suffering, no negativity can survive. The acceptance of suffering is a journey into death. Facing deep. 185. The power of now. Pain, allowing it to be, taking your attention into it, is to enter death consciously. When you have died this death, you realize that there is no death, and there is nothing to fear. Only the ego dies. Imagine a ray of sunlight that has forgotten it is an inseparable part of the sun and deludes itself into believing it has to fight for survival and create and cling to an identity other than the sun. Would the death of this delusion not be incredibly liberating? Do you want an easy death? Would you rather die without pain, without agony? Then die to the past every moment and let the light of your presence shine away the heavy, time-bound self you thought of as you. The Way of the Cross there are many accounts of people who say they have found God through their deep suffering, and there is the Christian expression, the way of the cross, which I suppose points to the same thing. We are concerned with nothing else here. Strictly speaking, they did not find God through their suffering, because suffering implies resistance. They found God through surrender, through total acceptance of what is, into which they were forced by their intense suffering. They must have realized on some level that their pain was self-created. How do you equate surrender with finding God? Since resistance is inseparable from the mind, relinquishment of resistance, surrender, is the end of the mind as your master, the imposter pretending to be you, the false god. All judgment and all. 186. The meaning of surrender. Negativity dissolve. The realm of being, which had been obscured by the mind, then opens up. Suddenly, a great stillness arises within you, an unfathomable sense of peace. And within that peace, there is great joy. And within that joy, there is love. And at the innermost core, there is the sacred, the immeasurable, that which cannot be named. I don't call it finding God, because how can you find that which was never lost, the very life that you are? The word God is limiting not only because of thousands of years of misperception and misuse, but also because it implies an entity other than you. God is being itself, not a being. There can be no subject-object relationship here, no duality, no you and God. God realization is the most natural thing there is. The amazing and incomprehensible fact is not that you can become conscious of God, but that you are not conscious of God. The way of the cross that you mentioned is the old way to enlightenment, and until recently it was the only way. But don't dismiss it or underestimate its efficacy. It still works. The way of the cross is a complete reversal. It means that the worst thing in your life, your cross, turns into the best thing that ever happened to you, by forcing you into surrender, into death, forcing you to become as nothing, to become as God, because God, too, is no thing. At this time, as far as the unconscious majority of humans is concerned, the way of the cross is still the only way. They will only awaken through further suffering, and enlightenment, as a collective phenomenon, will be predictably preceded by vast upheavals. This process reflects the workings of certain universal laws that govern the growth of consciousness, and thus was foreseen by some seers. It is described, among other places, in the Book of Revelation, or Apocalypse, though cloaked in obscure and sometimes impenetrable symbology. This suffering is inflicted not by God, but by humans on themselves and on each other, as well as by certain defensive Mishuas that the Earth, which is a living, intelligent organism, is due to take to protect herself from the onslaught of human madness. 187. The power of now. However, there is a growing number of humans alive today whose consciousness is sufficiently evolved not to need any more suffering before the realization of enlightenment. You may be one of them. Enlightenment through suffering, the way of the cross, means to be forced into the kingdom of heaven kicking and screaming. You finally surrender because you can't stand the pain anymore but the pain could go on for a long time until this happens. Enlightenment consciously chosen means to relinquish your attachment to past and future, and to make the now the main focus of your life. 
It means choosing to dwell in the state of presence rather than in time. It means saying yes to what is. You then don't need pain anymore. How much more time do you think you will need before you are able to say, I will create no more pain, no more suffering? How much more pain do you need before you can make that choice? If you think that you need more time, you will get more time. And more pain. Time and pain are inseparable. The power to choose. What about all those people who, it seems, actually want to suffer? I have a friend whose partner is physically abusive toward her, and her previous relationship was of a similar kind. Why does she choose such men, and why is she refusing to get out of that situation now? Why do so many people actually choose pain? I know that the word choose is a favorite new age term, but it isn't entirely accurate in this context. It is misleading to say that somebody chose a dysfunctional relationship or any other negative situation in his or her life. Choice implies consciousness, a high degree of conciseness. Without it, you have no choice. Choice begins the moment you disidentify from the mind and its conditioned patterns, the moment you become present. Until you reach that point, you are unconscious, spiritually speaking. This means that you are compelled. 188. The meaning of surrender. To think, feel, and act in certain ways according to the conditioning of your mind. That is why Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is not related to intelligence in the conventional sense of the word. I have met many highly intelligent and educated people who were also completely unconscious, which is to say completely identified with their mind. In fact, if mental development and increased knowledge are not counterbalanced by a corresponding growth in consciousness, the potential for unhappiness and disaster is very great. Your friend is stuck in a relationship with an abusive partner and not for the first time. Why? No choice. The mind, conditioned as it is by the past, always seeks to recreate what it knows and is familiar with. Even if it is painful, at least it is familiar. The mind always adheres to the known. The unknown is dangerous because it has no control over it. That's why the mind dislikes and ignores the present. Moment. Present moment awareness creates a gap not only in the stream of mind but also in the past-future continuum. Nothing truly new and creative can come into this world except through that gap, that clear space of infinite possibility. So your friend, being identified with her mind, may be recreating. A pattern learned in the past in which intimacy and abuse are inseparably linked. Alternatively, she may be acting out a mind pattern learned in early childhood according to which she is unworthy and deserves to be punished. It is possible, too, that she lives a large part of her life through the pain body, which always seeks more pain on which to feed. Her partner has his own unconscious patterns, which complement hers. Of course her situation is self-created, but who or what is the self that is doing the creating? A mental-emotional pattern from the past, no more. Why make a self out of it? If you tell her that she has chosen her condition or situation, you are reinforcing her state of mind identification. But is her mind pattern who she is? Is it her? Self? Is her true identity derived from the past? Show your friend how. To be the observing presence behind her thoughts and her emotions. Tell her about the pain body and how to free herself from it. Teach her. 189. The power of now. The art of inner body awareness. Demonstrate to her the meaning of presence. As soon as she is able to access the power of the now, and thereby break through her conditioned past, she will have a choice. Nobody chooses dysfunction, conflict, pain. Nobody chooses insanity. They happen because there is not enough presence in you to dissolve the past, not enough light to dispel the darkness. You are not fully here. You have not quite woken up yet. In the meantime, the conditioned mind is running your life. Similarly, if you are one of the many people who have an issue with their parents, if you still harbor resentment about something they did or did not do, then you still believe that they had a choice, that they could have acted differently. It always looks as if people had a choice, but that is an illusion. As long as your mind with its conditioned patterns runs your life, as long as you are your mind, what? Choice do you have? None? You are not even there. The mind identity. Fight state is severely dysfunctional. It is a form of insanity. Almost everyone is suffering from this illness in varying degrees. The moment you realize this, there can be no more resentment. How can you resent someone's illness? The only appropriate response is compassion. 
So that means nobody is responsible for what they do. I don't like that idea. If you are run by your mind, although you have no choice you will still suffer the consequences of your unconsciousness, and you will create further suffering. You will bear the burden of fear, conflict, problems, and pain. The suffering thus created will eventually force you out of your unconscious state. What you say about choice also applies to forgiveness, I suppose. You need to be fully conscious and surrender before you can forgive. 190. The meaning of surrender. Forgiveness is a term that has been in use for 2,000 years, but most people have a very limited view of what it means. You cannot truly forgive yourself or others as long as you derive your sense of self from the past. Only through accessing the power of the now, which is your own power, can there be true forgiveness. This renders the past POW earless, and you realize deeply that nothing you ever did, or that was ever done to you could touch even in the slightest the radiant essence of who you are. The whole concept of forgiveness then becomes unnecessary. And how do I get to that point of realization? When you surrender to what is and so become fully present, the past ceases to have any power. You do not need it anymore. Presence is the key. The now is the key. How will I know when I have surrendered? When you no longer need to ask the question. Thank you so much for tuning into this audiobook. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing to the channel for more.